I finally caught a break in the weather, so I decided to go out to the anechoic chamber and do some testing. I feel it's important to test outside because the closer you are to any boundary, the more reflections you get in your measurement. The further you can get from the reflection, the cleaner your data will be. So this speaker here is the Life S5 I've been working on and I finally was finished. It was completely assembled and I figured it's time to get outside and get some true finished data on this speaker. So that's what I'm doing. I, f I measure one speaker and then I swap it out for the other speaker because I think it's important to measure both, not just one, because what if I made a mistake in the crossover assembly or something like that? You just really don't know. Looking at the data, we can see we have a very linear response all the way from 150 hertz and up. I will talk about below 150 hertz later. When I did the tweeter testing, uh, if you've seen that video, you may recall that these two samples had a little bit of discrepancy in sensitivity, which is unfortunate. But I gotta say, um, audibly, I haven't really picked up on this difference. Overall, these speakers image really well, and this hasn't been as much of an issue as I thought it would be. So this is about the only downside with this speaker so far. You can see just how um, linear the response is. Uh, most manufacturers go for plus or minus 3 dB, and that's probably being a little bit generous for most speakers. They're probably more like plus or minus five. So overall, this is um, really, you know, a high fidelity frequency response that a lot of manufacturers hope to get. I should mention those wrinkles in the top octave are a calibration issue I've been dealing with. And I've tried other software and I don't get that. So it's something I need to sort out with Sandy Sound Easy. Ever since I changed laptops, it's been an issue. Okay, so now um, here I'm going to measure the horizontal off-axis response. So I went from 0 out to 60 degrees. And um, this is just a tedious process of changing the angle and trying to keep everything consistent. Here we have the horizontal off-axis response from 0 out to 60 degrees in 10, in 10 degree increments. And you can see around the crossover point, the crossover point is about 1600 hertz. The, the woofer does start to beam a little bit, and some of that is also diffraction rated, related to the baffle. Um, so you get a little bit of uh, off-axis beaming um, around 1500 hertz. And then things bunch up again around 3 kilohertz up to 5 or 6 kilohertz. This is also related to diffraction, but it's also related to the fact that the tweener has gone omnidirectional. Now this is a one inch tweeter with a five inch woofer, and you can see the change in on off axis behavior between the woofer and the tweeter. This is far worse with a six or seven inch woofer, which is very common in most speakers. As we move further up in frequency, especially above 10 kilohertz, the tweeter starts to beam and uh, you see a lot of off-axis energy lost as you move off-axis. Okay, and just to kind of analyze this a little bit more, when talking about the off-axis energy, you can see that uh, through the crossover range, as the di cabinet diffraction and woofer beaming kind of, they kind of show a lack of energy through this area. And then once the diffraction and tweeter go omni, you can see that there's a little bit of excess energy around three kilohertz, four kilohertz. Uh, I don't find this particularly audible, but it can be if you're not careful. Uh, a lot of people complain about dome tweeter sounding spitty or something like that. This is often the issue here. A lot of people will EQ a smiley face dip right there too. Okay, now I wanted the vertical off-axis response, and it's important to measure above and below when you're doing vertical off-axis. You shouldn't mirror these measurements. I did that with horizontal. I measured only in one orientation, but with vertical, you got to measure above and then again below. Uh, so here I'm, I'm measuring above. I'm twisting the speaker in a way that puts the microphone above the speaker. And uh, then we can look at the results. And this, this is exactly what I was trying to achieve with this speaker. In my previous videos, you kept hearing me talk about 
close tweeter spacing and low crossover and all this stuff. This is because when you move off axis vertically, sitting so close to the speaker in a desktop situation, um, you can create really deep nulls, especially around the crossover range. And uh, you can see out to 40 degrees just how linear and consistent this speaker stays. It stays very well composed. Now we're gonna measure below the vertical axis. So here you can see things aren't quite as pretty as above the ax vertical axis. And uh, this is why you have to measure in both directions. This is because the diffraction characteristic at the top edge of the baffle is changing and also the vertical lobe, so this is when the drivers are truly in phase with each other, is just pointed up a little bit. So when you go downwards, uh, you do start to come out of phase with the drivers just a little more than you do above axis. So overall, this is still exceptionally good, especially when you compare to like a big flange dome tweeter and a six inch midwoofer or something like that. This is way better than you'll see in many, many speakers. I have the WT3 hooked up to the speaker and to the laptop. Still something's not right. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Okay, I think we're in business now. Let's try this again. Hook it up to the second speaker here. Awesome. Excellent agreement. Okay, um, a couple things to note here. First of all, we can see from this result that um, the box simulations that I did, I'm not sure if I shared them on any of my videos, but they um, I verified them here with this uh, resonance peak around 70 hertz. This is what the box model predicted. Uh, we can also see that it matches the impedance profile that I generated in XSIM. And we can also see both drivers are fairly consistent between one another. There isn't any, you know, um, there isn't much variation between crossover parts or the electrical parameters of each driver. Things are generally in agreement, and this is a good thing. We can also see that it's a, a 4 ohm driver, but really not in a difficult load. The last thing I needed to do here, I, I forgot to do this is I needed to take a near field measurement to see what the low frequency response looks like. Here we have the low frequency response. Um, I, In the video I showed it being measured in sound easy but I went to home impulse. That's my software that I prefer to use for low frequency ground plane measurements, near fields and all that kind of stuff. We have a typical sealed roll off it rolls off higher than a ported box normally does, but it's more consistent and relaxed than a ported roll-off. We have a roll-off of about 8 dB per octave. Uh, we have an F3 of about, um, you know, 85, 86 hertz. So overall, this is a very gentle, easy roll-off. It's higher than normal, but because we're on a in a desktop situation where we have the reinforcement from the desk and you're sitting close to the speaker, so the bass is a little more apparent, um, a lot of people will go for less baffle step compensation with the desktop speaker, but in this case the sealed roll-off matches perfectly, uh, at least for my ears. This, um, this gives a very precise, very balanced sounding bass um, in the speaker. Hey guys, sorry that was so technical and sorry that this series has dragged on for so many parts. I didn't really anticipate that, but maybe it gives you a bit of an idea of how much goes into even a simple speaker like this one. Uh, there's a lot more involved than sometimes people think there is. The objective performance of the speaker far exceeds my expectations. It's great. It's, it does exactly what I was looking for. So anyways, I'm really impressed with this. I have talked to Eric at uh, DIYSoundGroup.com and if you truly are interested, I'm not asking you to do this if you're not, but if you're interested in these speakers and would like the opportunity to build a pair, ask him to get them on his website. I've given him all the information. I've worked with Eric quite a bit over the uh, past probably six or seven years now. And um, he's considering putting these on the website. So if you think they'd be a good addition, check it out. And not just for these speakers, but also check out the rest of his site. There may be other types of speakers there that interest you. Uh, it's a phenomenal 
uh, website to order from. Oh, and that reminds me, I gotta say thank you guys. Uh, we, since the last video, we have broke past the 1,000 subscriber mark. Uh, and that is phenomenal, and I, I gotta thank you guys. Um, and and even, even with that, it's been a couple weeks since my last video. Even since then, we've almost hit 1,100 subscribers. So that's like 10% since the last video so something happened there where just people are catching on and they're seeing this channel which is fantastic news check out more of my videos spread the word guys really appreciate it and thanks for bearing with me on this technical stuff i hope it was helpful i think it should you know shed some light on the true performance of these things and why they sound so good and why i did what i did to get these speakers the way i wanted them thanks guys talk to you later